good to be together on this uh, final day of chapel for this school year. We're in for a treat, as always, as our brother Fred Luter is here to share with us. And we just want to celebrate uh, the hope that we have as believers. Dr. Shaddix has reminded us uh, yesterday, a wonderful little passage there in Acts about uh, the hope, how the Lord's Supper looked forward to when they would celebrate the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. So we're going to sing about heaven a little bit this morning. You have there the, the numbers that you'll need. We'll sing the first and last stanzas of each one of those three hymns. You might not even need those this morning. As we look forward with uh, anticipation to the hope that is before us, the hope of eternity with our Lord and Savior. Let's stand together as we sing this morning, When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, still prepare for us to play. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore, to our bountiful Father above, we will offer the tribute of praise, for the glorious gift of His The trumpet of the Lord shall come, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the Slay before the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll
be seated. We continue with that theme of hope as the seminarians sing of an African-American spiritual born out of hope. Soon I'll be done with the troubles of this world. Next week, you'll be done with the troubles of finals. If that's your trouble this morning, bring it to the Lord. Leave it here. Then study later. All right. Soon I'll be done with the troubles of this world. Wow! Wasn't that great? I believe it was British churchman John Henry Newman who said there was a time when we think about the second coming of Christ when it was like a man who was racing towards a cliff. And every step he took, took him closer to going over the side of that cliff. Every day we live took us closer to the second coming of Christ. But he said, we're not living in a day like that anymore. Now it's like a man who is running alongside the edge of that cliff when any given step could put him over the edge. Now for the church, any day we wake up could be the day that Jesus is coming back. And whoa, the prayers we have going up on this campus, some of you praying that he'll come back before you take your finals. 
And those who are graduating, pray that He won't come back until you get that diploma in your hand. But God in His wisdom knows the very best time for Him to come. And when He comes, what a day of glory it will be. We're so excited and honored to have with us on campus for these couple of days a, a group of our Extension Center directors who come from all over the southeastern United States. Among them is Dr. Charles Harvey, who's the Extension Center Director for Florida and works with all of our Florida programs. In the Orlando campus alone, they more than doubled in their enrollment in this year. That's what I call an outstanding job. Dr. Charles Harvey, would you please lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. We do welcome you to our closing chapel service for this academic year on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. What a wonderful year it has been, how God has touched and stirred our lives in so many different ways through so many different speakers and music. It's just been a wonderful, rich year in chapel. We're delighted to have with us for this closing chapel service a group of the students from Van Cleve, Mississippi, who'd rather Brother Fred come miss school and come over here and hear you preach than go to class. But we're delighted to have them with us today and hope that they will enjoy their time on our campus. Fred Luter is the pastor of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Fred is a wonderful, wonderful child of God who loves Jesus with all of his heart, loves people with all of his heart. He went to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church when they were absolutely below dead. Now, Brother Fred, come on up here for just a second, please. Yes, sir. How many people were there your first Sunday as pastor of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church? First Sunday, there were 50 people in attendance, 65 on row. And they only came, that many were there, because he was the first African-American pastor that church had ever had. They went through a radical change in the community and transition. They were struggling and dying. And they came to Fred, and they gave him a twofold. He had one of two choices. What were those two choices? Two choices was that was given to me from my DOM was either resurrect this church or we're going to bury it. One of the two. So how many people showed up for worship last Sunday? Last Sunday in all three services, we had about 5,000. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Now, one reason why I always ask Fred to tell us a little bit of that story is so that you will know it is possible for Jesus to turn churches around. It is possible for the Lord who rose from the grave to resurrect a dying church. Amen. It takes a man of vision and a man who is willing to risk his ministry, his life, in order to throw everything into a situation that may not work. You will never know until you give it Everything, Amen. and that's what Fred Luter has done. It's one of it is our largest Baptist church now in the city. It is close to our campus, brother Fred. How do they get here? Oh, to easy, YouTube. right from this campus. Just uh, the street outside is Gentilly Boulevard. Make a right on Gentilly, go to the second red light, is which is Franklin Avenue. Can't make a left, so you got to make that U turn, which you want to go left towards the river, and uh, go about a half, about, about a mile. And as soon as you get across this overpass, everywhere you see folk running to get a seat. That's Franklin Avenue Baptist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that is not a joke. That is the truth. What time are your services on Sunday? If you're an early morning person, we have a 7 a.m. service. I do say 7 a.m. in the morning. We have about 900 people at 7 a.m. in the morning worshiping. Me. And it rocks. It is I'm rocks. telling you. Amen. And the 10 15, that's the service you preach that for. And we have a 10 15, and then we have a 12 15 service uh, every Sunday. Three morning services 7 a.m., 10 15, and 12 15. Now, most of Brother Fred's members are African American folks, but Fred is it okay if. Anglos like me come and worship at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Y'all, come on down. Come on down. <laughs> yes, it is. God called you to seminary to the city of New Orleans, a city that is predominantly African American in its composition. If you as an Anglo have never worshipped with an African American congregation, 
it would be a sin for you to spend this much time in New Orleans Amen. and not do that. And I want to encourage you to visit Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. It's very close to the campus. There are other wonderful congregations of African American and other ethnic groups throughout our city. And you need to use this opportunity to be in a church with a different ethnic group, with people who may have grown up in different circumstances, and to find out how much like you they are Amen. in their love for Jesus. If you get through your time at seminary and you've never invited into your home for dinner to have a meal with your children, someone from a different ethnic group, it's a sin. You ought to use this time at seminary to broaden your horizons, to expose your family to people from different ethnic groups, because we, what we discover when we get together is we all love Jesus, don't Amen. we? That's the bottom line. And we all are giving our lives to serving Him. Amen. We thank you so much for being with us. It's we'll be praying for you as you share the word. Whenever Brother Fred preaches, there are always two things you know are going to happen. One, the message will be delivered with great passion. I warned you to bring your own seatbelt. If you didn't, it's your fault. Two, it will be an exposition of the Word of God, a message from God's Word. We look forward to hearing that, and we all want to be praying for Brother Fred because he has been asked to deliver the convention sermon for the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in New Orleans this summer. It's a great honor, and we want to lift him up in prayer as he prepares for that task. Let's continue our worship now, then we'll hear a word from Brother Fred. It's been a good year in so many ways. Not been without difficulties, though. But God, through it all, has shown Himself to be powerful, to be loving, to be gracious. And we just want to stop and give Him thanks for all of that this morning. If you need the text, it's 153 in your hymnal. How could I say thanks for all that you have done for me? Let's stand together in honor of the Lord and giving Him thanks this morning. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me?
Let's give God, Dr. Ken and the seminaries a great hand in their blessings. Man. I've had the privilege of preaching at four of the six uh, Southern Baptist seminaries, and I tell you, uh, some of the best music is here at New Orleans Seminary. And I'm not saying that because uh, I'm from here and uh, kind of have uh, been a part of this uh, seminary, but I'm just saying that honestly, some of the best singing that I've ever heard in chapels of uh, Southern Baptist seminaries have been right here at this school. So again, I want to commend uh, Dr. Ken and these guys for doing a great, great job. Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Amen. Giving obedience to God, my Father, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord and Savior of my life, to the president of this wonderful, wonderful seminary. My friend, Dr. Chuck Kelly, thank you again, brother, for this tremendous opportunity that you have given to me. As I say, every time I stand here, this brother knows a lot of pastors and preachers from across this nation and this city that could be standing in this pulpit uh, at this chapel service. But I thank God that you thought something of this uh, street kid from the Lord Nightwater, the city of New Orleans. Amen, brother, to invite me to be a part of this service. His wonderful and gracious wife, Dr. Rhonda Kelly, it's always good to see you. Dr. Shattuck, to all the other professors and staff members of this seminary, and particularly to the students, I am indeed delighted and excited because I have been invited to be back here with you at another chapel service here at this seminary. I eagerly look forward to being here. As a matter of fact, I was telling my wife on last night, I'm, I'm preaching so much now at New Orleans Seminary that now I have to wonder, now what did I preach there the last time? What did I preach before? Um, so I, I, I'm, I, God has really blessed my life to be able to stand in this place and share the Word of God. Speaking of my wife, I don't like to go anywhere without uh, letting folk know who I'm in love with. Some of you have never met her before, but she's the best part of me. She's the love of my life, the apple of my eye, my prime rib, my good thing. Amen. The Bible says he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. The Bible says God took a rib out of Adam's side. I believe it was a prime rib. Amen. My prime rib, my good thing. My wife Elizabeth. Will you stand, David? It says she is over there. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good all the time. Amen. All the time. God is good. It's good to see some uh, Franklin Avenue uh, folk here. Thank you so very much for being here and all of you. We praise the Lord for all of you sharing and being a part of this seminary chapel service. Turn your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of St. Matthew. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16. You've studied all semester. You've studied all year. You've been planning. You've been praying. You've been equipped by this seminary now to go out into the highways, into the hedges, and the byways of life. Those of you who are graduating, those of you who are finishing, even those of you who are still in school, you're now going out into the out of the othermost parts of dirt. You're going out to your ministry fields, to the places where God has assigned you at. You're going out to share the Word of God. You're going out to lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The question I want to ask this morning as we share in this last chapel service, what type of church are you preparing for lost people to come in? What type of church are you preparing for those who are down and out, those who are struggling, those who are looking for some hope? What kind of church are you preparing for those individuals to come and to sit at the master's, uh, at the, and hear the master's word and sit at your feet and to hear God's word so that their lives can be changed and renewed? My friend, something is wrong here in America. I believe when we have all of these churches and all of these cities and all of these ministries, yet it still looks like hell is winning the war. There's something wrong with that picture. And I want to challenge you as you're about to go out into your chosen fields, whether it's here in the south or whether it's in the north or whether it's in the east or whether it's in the west, whether it's in a rural community, whether it's in the suburb, whether it's in the inner city, I want to challenge you to build a church that people can come through the doors of that church and see Jesus Christ high and lift it up and their lives will be changed for eternity. Matthew chapter 16 I want you to look at with me verses 18 and 19 of that chapter. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19 of that chapter. If you have it, please say amen. amen. Matter of fact, you can say amen all throughout the sermon. I'm kind of used to it, if you all understand what I'm talking about. Amen. <laughs> for, for Jeff, for, that's my, amen. Brother Friend got me. Amen. Amen. Corner. Jesus is speaking. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Father, we thank and praise you for this privilege and opportunity that you've given us to be at New Orleans Seminary one more time. Thank you for the leadership of Dr. Kelly. Thank you for all that he has done to allow this seminary to be, God, what you want it to be. Thank you for the young men and the young ladies who are being trained here in all areas of ministry. God, we pray that as they go out into the vineyard, God, as they go out into this world, God, that you have already equipped them to do the work of the ministry. God, I pray that as I share in this time of preaching, that as always you would allow me to decrease as you increase. Lord, hide me behind the cross. Let them not see Fred, but God, let them see Christ. To the end that you may be glorified, saints of God may be edified, that Satan may be horrified. We we'll be so very careful to give your name all the praise, the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and for his sake, and again, let the people of God say, Amen. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the time that I have remained this morning, in a challenge to those of you who are about to go out into the Lord's vineyard, on a preach this morning from the subject, the church that Christ builds. The church that Christ builds. When I was a little kid, Dr. Kelly, one of my favorite nursery rhymes was uh, Big Bad Wolf and the Three Little Pigs. How many of y'all remember that nursery rhyme, Big Bad Wolf and the Three Little Pigs? Pastor Bro was the story about Big Bad Wolf and Three Little Pigs, and he, you know the story. These uh, uh, pigs would build this house, and they built this straw house. And as they built this straw house, Dr. Stone, this Big Bad Wolf, came up there, and so that straw house knocked on the door and said, Let me in, let me in, let me in. And of course, Dr. Kelly, you know what they said, Not by the hair of my... Now, y'all know this story. Not by the hair, by chinny, chin, chin. So if you don't let me in, I'm going to huff, and I'm going to puff, and I'm going to blow your house down. And say, we're not going to let you in. So the big bad wolf huffed, and he puffed, and he blew the straw house down. The little pigs, Dr. Ken, were in a family. They ran down the street, and they built another house. This time, they built Dr. Harvey a wood house. And sure enough, after they built that wood house, here comes that big bad wolf all over again, George. And that big bad wolf friend came to the door, knocked on the door, said, let me in, let me in, let me in. And they said, not by the hair of my... Oh, y'all good, y'all good. Not by the hair of my chinny, chin, chin. So if you don't let me in, I'm going to huff, and I'm going to puff, and I'm going to blow your house down. So he huffed and he puffed, and he blew that wooden house down. So those pigs frantically left that house and went down the street and said, now wait a minute, we've got to get smart. We built the straw house and the big bear wolf blew this one down. We built the wooden house, male, and the big bear house, big bear wolf blew that down. He said, now we got to get small. He said, now let's build a different kind of house. So these little pigs put their mind together and their heads together, Dr. Kelly, and they built a brick house. And sure enough, right after they built the brick house, here comes that big bear wolf all over again. He was bold. I mean, he was confident. After all, why would he not be confident? He's blown down the wooden house. He's blown down around the, the straw house. So he comes there big and bare like wide earth in the western town. And he comes say, let me in, let me in, let me in. Say, no, not by the hair of my... I promise you that's the last time I asked you to do that. Say, so not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Say, you don't let me in, I'm going to huff. And I'm going to puff, and I'm going to blow your house down. He said, we're not going to let you in. So Avery, he huffed, and he puffed, and he... And nothing happened. He huffed, and he puffed, and... Dr. Phillips, still nothing happened. He huffed, and he puffed, and... He blew again, but still nothing happened. And my friend, the pig's house were able to stand when they built the right kind of house. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. In like manner, there's a big bad wolf called Satan, called Lucifer, called the devil. And he's going around America. He's going around the world trying to blow down churches. He's trying to blow down our ministries. He's trying to blow down our testimonies. He's trying to blow down our reputations. He's trying to blow down our character. He's trying to blow down our witness. He's huffing and he's puffing. And he's using all the tricks of his trade to put off his diabolical scheme. However, my brothers and my sisters, 
in the midst of Satan's attack, God has sent me here this morning to tell you who are about to go out and start your ministries and about to go out and start your churches and about to go out into the mission field. God is yelling to us as believers and he's yelling to us as a church, stand church. God yells to the church, hold your position. God yells to the church, be strong. God yells to the church, don't give up. So the obvious question of the morning, my brothers and my sisters, is how can a church stand against the attacks of the devil? How can your church and my church, how can your ministry and my ministry, how can the ministry that you are about to go into as you leave this seminary campus, how is that church is going to stand? And the obvious answer, my brothers and my sisters, is it has to be a church that Christ builds. So, So for the next few moments, I want us to look at some characteristics of a church that Christ builds. I want us to look at something that that church must be about if that church is going to stand. Number one, if the church is going to stand, Jesus Christ must be the foundation of that church. If the church is going to stand, Jesus Christ must be the foundation of that church. Look at the first part of verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... I will build my church. Notice what Jesus said. Thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. In verse 13 of our text, Jesus asks the question of his disciples. Guys, you've been out in the community. You've been out into the neighborhood. You've been out into the hedges and valleys. You've been out into the streets. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, 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 and they gave him a, a several answers in verse 14. They said, and some said thou art John the Baptist, and some said thou art Elijah, and some said oh, others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And, 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 and Jesus said, well, I, I can see them uh, 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 thinking about Jeremiah. I can see them thinking about Elijah. Je- John the Baptist was a good person, but, but the wrong answer. Uh, 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 Elijah was a good leader, but the wrong answer. Uh, uh, Jeremiah was a good pre- preacher, but the wrong answer. Jesus said, I can see the world getting it wrong. I, I can see society getting it wrong. I can see those in the community getting it wrong. But then Jesus, Dr. Shaddix, looked those disciples in the eye and said, but listen, boy, guys, I need to ask you a question. Who do you say? That I am. Not, not, not the world. Not ABC, NBC, or CBS. Not CNN. But who do you say? I, the Son of Man, am. And here come Peter. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, 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 I can't wait to meet Peter. I just can't wait to meet him. I, I know, I know. And, 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 okay, uh, uh, and you understand, oh Lord, he go again. He go, he go, he go put his foot in his mouth again. And Peter said that. In verse 18, in verse 18, Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of, of the living God. And Jesus said, Boy, you got it right for a church. <laughs> but look, look at it right there. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said to him in verse 18, Based upon that saying, Based upon that statement of faith, based upon that truth, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, if Jesus isn't the foundation of the church, it's heading for a fall. John the Baptist was a good preacher, but the wrong foundation. Elijah was a good leader, but the wrong foundation. Jeremiah was a good prophet, but the wrong foundation. Oh, my friend, if the church is being built on anyone and anything other than Jesus Christ, that's the wrong foundation. I don't care how charismatic the preacher is, it's the wrong foundation. I don't care how good the choir sings, it's the wrong foundation. I don't care how large the congregation may be, it's the wrong foundation. I don't care how many ministers the church may have, it's the wrong foundation. If Jesus is not the foundation, if Jesus is not the center of attention, if Jesus is not the main focus, oh my friend, that church is in trouble because it's not about the pastor, it's about the master. It's not about the leader, it's about the Lamb of God. It's not about the creature, it's about the creator. It's not about the minister, it's about the Messiah. Oh my friend, if Jesus is not the foundation of your church and my church, be careful, watch out before you know it. One of these days, the enemy is going to come and he's going to huff and he's going to puff and he's going to blow the ministry down. Jesus must be the foundation of the church. 
Shattered, that's why the songwriter said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust definitely the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Not the pastor, not the deacons, not the trustees, not the choir director. On Jesus' name. On Christ. You know him, don't you? On Christ, Alpha and Omega. On Christ, the beginning there. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Oh, if you want your church to be successful, if you want your ministry to have an impact. It must be a church where Jesus is the foundation. Not only must it be a church where Jesus is the foundation, the second characteristic of a church that Christ builds, the church must be victorious in spiritual warfare. The church must be victorious in spiritual warfare. Look at the second part of verse 18. And I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't miss that. I will build my church. And Elaine, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My friend, if the church is going to stand, if your ministry is going to stand, it has to be a ministry where not only Jesus is the foundation, but it must be a ministry that's victorious in spiritual warfare. My friend, just because you're the church, it doesn't mean you're exempt from trouble. Doesn't mean you're exempt from trials. Just because you've been prepared adequately and well at this seminary. Brothers who are going to pastor, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have any trouble. Those who are going into music ministry, it doesn't mean that the enemy is not going to try to track you in. Those who are going in missionary fields, it doesn't mean that you're going to have it easy. Just because you're the church, it doesn't mean that you're exempt from trouble and trial and turmoils. I reminded Dr. Kelly of this new preacher had taken, who had taken over this church. And he was there for about a month, and he got a phone call from the former pastor. And the former, he was so excited that the former pastor had called him, and he said, sir, I'm so glad to hear from you. I'm so glad that you called me. Thank you so very much for calling me. I, I need your prayers. Just continue to pray for you. He said, son, I've been doing that. I've been praying for you. Not only have I been praying for you, I've done something for you that I think would help you in your ministry. He said, what's that, sir? He said, well, young man, uh, there are three envelopes I prepared under the desk of your, of your pool, uh, right there on, in, your pool, in the office. And whenever you go through some tough times, just look under the desk, and I uh, put three envelopes there, and I've numbered them, number one, number two, and number three. The first time, young man, because I've been there, I know the church. The first time you have trouble, I want you to open up envelope number one. The second time you have trouble, I want you to open up envelope number two. And the third time you have trouble, I want you to open up envelope number three. So sure enough, Dr. Kelly, he thanked the pastor for doing that. He was so excited that he called. And sure enough, six months down the line, he had his first uh, trouble. He had a, a, a storm that happened in the church. So you remember what the pastor said? He went to his study, looked under his uh, desk, and there was the envelope number one. And he opened envelope number one. Envelope number one said, blame the deacons. That's a good idea. So he blamed the deacons. And that, that, that went on for about a, a year. Everything went fine. But then he came across his second song, Dr. Ryan, and he came across his second song. He remember what the pastor said. And he went under his, his, his office and got that envelope that was number two, Dr. Ken, and that uh, next second envelope said, blame the leaders. And sure enough, he blamed the leaders, all the ministry leaders and, and those in ministry position. And, and, and he blamed them. And that, that lasted for about a year. He was all right. But then that third song came. He said, Lord, what I'm going to do? Then he remembered. I got that envelope. He got that last envelope. He opened up that last envelope. Envelope number three said, prepare three letters. <laughs> Some of y'all are going to get that by 12 o'clock after you lunch. Just because you're in ministry, amen, that doesn't mean you're exempt from trouble. It doesn't mean that the enemy is going to leave you alone. It doesn't mean that the enemy will not come after you and try to destroy what God is doing in your life and in your church and in your ministry. Just because you're in the church, it doesn't mean we're exempt from turmoil and we're exempt from envy. It doesn't mean that you're exempt from bitterness and jealousy and cliques and complaints in the church. Satan will use whoever and whatever he can, but Jesus said, he shall not prevail. 
You need to realize that the devil will use anybody and everybody in your church and in your ministry to try to destroy what God is doing in your life and what God is doing in your ministry. But the hope is, and the answer is, Jesus said, don't be surprised, even though those things are going to come, you just got to realize that the, the, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Isaiah 54 and 17 said, no weapon, no weapon that's formed against thee shall prosper. In other words, brothers and sisters, it won't work. Gossip won't work. Rumors won't work. Lies won't work. Financial troubles won't work. Disgruntled membership won't work. No matter what Satan's tactics is, no matter what he tries or who he's going to use, the Bible says that if it's built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, that church will prevail in spiritual welfare. When Jesus is the foundation, my friend, you've got to realize that that church will stand. Yes, Satan will try all he can. He will use everybody he can, but the Bible says he just won't prevail. Sometimes the deacons are going to get devilish, but they just won't prevail. Sometimes the trustees are going to get tricky. They just won't prevail. Sometimes the choir is going to get cranky. They just won't prevail. Sometimes the ushers are going to start acting ugly. They just won't prevail. Sometimes the teenagers are going to get real treacherous. They shall not prevail. Sometimes the members get real messy. They shall not prevail. Sometimes the preacher even gets pushy, but he shall not prevail. Oh, my friend, it's a warfare. It's a battle. And God has given us our armor in Ephesians chapter 6 to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Heaven and all, stand, have your loins girded about with you. Stand with the breastplate of righteousness. Stand with your feet shot of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Oh, my friend, yes, we're going to be shot at. Yes, the enemy is going to try to attack. But the foundation says, the rock says, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As long as Jesus is the captain of the ship, as long as Jesus is the foundation of the church, oh, my friend, Satan is going to huff and Satan is going to puff, but according to the word of God, he shall not prevail. That's why we can sing with assurance, church, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. That's our attitude. I told Satan, get thee behind me, because victory today is mine. If the church is going to be able to stand, Jesus must be the foundation. And secondly, uh, uh, the church must be victorious in spiritual warfare, because if you're not careful, one day Satan is going to huff, and he's going to puff, and he's going to try to blow your ministry down. But then there's one more thing, and then we bid you good morning. If the church, if the church is going to stand, if the ministry is going to be successful in reaching the lost, in equipping the saved, in exalting the Savior, Jesus must be the foundation. The church must be victorious in spiritual warfare. And there's one more thing. The church must have the right keys for locked doors. The church must have the right keys for locked doors. Look at the first part of verse 19. Jesus said, and I will give unto you the keys with an S on it of the kingdom of heaven. If the church is going to stand, the church must have the right keys for locked doors. The Bible says, Dr. Shaddock, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, that the thief come in out but to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. My brothers and my sisters, God wants to give us abundant life. He wants to give us an abundant ministry. He wants to give us ministries that will change hearts and change lives and change families and change husbands and wives. And change. He wants to give us that type of abundant life. However, my friend, Satan doesn't want that to happen. So the enemy will do all that he can to try to come and close doors in your face. Every time you try to pursue something, every time you try to start something, every time you think you've got a great idea from God where God has given you and you try to implement it, watch out, Satan will try to close that door. You'll go into a business meeting and Satan will close that door. You'll talk to somebody else and Satan will close that door. you try to work it out with the leadership and Satan will close that door. My friend, you've got to realize that Satan will try to close doors in your face. Think about it. It's not unusual for that to happen to some of us. Think about it. That raise you deserve and the enemy will close that door. That promotion you earned uh, and the enemy will close that door. That habit you've been trying to kick and the enemy will close that door. That relationship you've been trying to fix and the enemy will close that door. That marriage you've been trying to 
men, and the enemy closed that door. That person you've been trying to forgive, and the enemy closed that door. That physical problem you've been praying about, and the enemy closed that door. That financial dilemma you've been trying to overcome, and the enemy closed that door. Those ministries you've been trying to start and develop so that your church can be more effective in the community. But every time look like you try, Satan closes that door. And the reason, brothers and sisters, he does it, you've got to understand is this. He wants you to get discouraged. He wants you to get bitter. He wants you to give up. He wants you to lose your faith. He wants you to get mad at God and say, God, you told me to do this. Why is this happening? God, you led me to this place. Why is nothing happening? God, I know this is where you want me to be. What in the world is going on? He wants you to resign. He wants you to, to get discouraged. He wants you to do those things that will not cause you to stand in the midst of the warfare that you're facing. However, my brothers and my sisters, you've got to realize that before you get discouraged, sisters, look in your purse. Brothers, before you throw in the towel, look in your pocket. Teenager, before you uh, uh, do something that was going to be foolish, look around your neck. And pastor, before you do something that, God, that you will regret later and later, look around your desk or, or, or look somewhere, but don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Before you give up, you got to look for them. you got to search for them. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Before you get discouraged, you got to find your keys. You gotta find your keys. You gotta find your keys. Oh, what's the purpose of keys? I'm kinda glad y'all asked. That kinda frees me up to give you the answer. The purpose of keys is to open locked doors. You don't hear me? The purpose of keys is to open locked doors. My friend, whatever door Satan closes in your face, Jesus said, I will give you the key to open that locked door. So whatever you're facing, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Look for your keys. Look for your keys. Because Shannon God has given us a key to those locked doors. When the closed doors of affliction, use your Psalm 34, 19 key. That said, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of Find that key and open up that door. When the closed door is doubt, find your Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 key. That said, trust in the Lord with all of thine heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He shall that your path. Find that key and open up that door. When the closed door is still, your friend are going into a new field. Your friend are going into an inner city. Well, find that Isaiah 26 and 3 key that said, Thou will keep them in perfect peace, whose mind is stand on thee, because they're trusting us. Find that key and open up that door. When the closed door is confidence, don't throw in the towel. Don't whip out. Find your Philippians chapter 4 and 13 key that says, I can do all things through Christ that give. Find that key and open up that door. When the closed door is trials and trouble in the ministry, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think God has abandoned you. Find your Romans 8 and 28 key that says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them will call the party to his purpose. All find that key and open up that door. When the closed door is salvation for a loved one, you're praying for that person. You're praying for that husband. You're praying for that wife. You're praying for that son or daughter. Don't throw in the towel. Find that Romans 10, 9 and 10 key that says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believe it unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Oh, when you're worried about making ends meet, and how you're going to pay the light bill and the phone bill, how the ministry is going to go, oh, don't throw in the tower. Find your Philippians 4 and 19 key that says, But my God, but my God, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Oh, brothers and sisters, whatever the dough is, don't give up. God has given us the keys to open locked doors. And because professors, because students, because seminarians, because my brothers and my sisters, he has given us the keys. He has given us the authority to use the keys. Hello? Because he's given us the keys. He's given us the authority to use those keys. If you go out in the cemetery yard over here and you find some keys that looks like a a, a car, it looks like a, a Ford, a Oldsmobile, a Chevy, or an Oldsmobile, you say, oh, I think I know who these keys for. And you go and you try to open up that car. Guess what? The, 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 the police here can arrest you because why? You didn't have the authority to open up that car or use those keys. However, 
Because Jesus gives us the keys. He gives the authority to use the keys. And Jesus says, since I gave you the keys, you have authority to unlock doors. You have my authority to unlock doors. You have my okay. You have my permission. So brothers and sisters, whatever you do, find your keys. Then Jesus closes out this text and says at the end of verse 19, Therefore, therefore, because Jesus is your foundation, therefore, because you have victory in spiritual warfare, therefore, because you have the keys to lock doors, therefore, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. In other words, my brothers and my sisters, as you go out into your ministry field, as you go out and do the thing that God has called you to do and this seminary has prepared you to do, whatsoever you bind or forbid to be done on earth, Jesus said is already forbid in heaven. And whatever you loose or permit to be done on earth, Jesus said is already loose in heaven. Well, brothers and my sisters, as I come to close, there are some things that we have to bind and there are some things that we have to loose in our ministries. There are some things we've got to bind and there are some things we've got to loose in our ministry. So come on, church. Let's bind apathy. Let's bind a bitterness. Let's bind confusion. Let's bind adultery. Let's bind teenage pregnancy. Let's bind doubt. Let's bind envy. Let's bind church mess. Let's bind divorce. Let's bind racism. Let's bind sin. Let's bind the enemy by the authority that has been given to us by Jesus Christ because they're already, they're already bound in heaven. And after we bind some things, brothers and sisters, let's loose some things. Let's loose the gifts that God has given to the church. Let's loose helps. Let's lose prophecy. Let's lose preaching. Let's lose teaching. Let's lose ministry. Lose commitment. Lose forgiveness. Lose harmony. Lose peace. Lose love. Lose joy. Lose salvation. Lose faith. Lose victorious living. Lose witnessing. Lose effective ministries that will transform our states and transform our cities and transform our community by the authority that's been given to us by Jesus Christ because they're already loosed in heaven. So come on, seminarians. Come on, my brothers and my sisters, as you're about to graduate, as you're about to go into your chosen field of ministry, let's build the church that Jesus would be proud of. Let's build the church that Jesus would honor. Let's be the church that Jesus would glorify. Oh, my friend, let's love what Jesus loves. Let's hate what Jesus hates. Let's bind what Jesus binds. Let's loose what Jesus loose because we have the right foundation, because we are victorious in spiritual warfare, and because we have the right keys for locked doors. And because we have the authority of Jesus Christ to use those keys, let's do the thing that God has called us to do. Because if you're not careful, one of these days the enemy is going to come and he's going to try to huff and he's going to try to puff and he's going to try to blow your ministry down. But just like that brick house, that brick house stood because it was built on the right foundation. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, as I come to close, make sure your ministry is built on the right foundation. Make sure you're victorious in spiritual warfare. And make sure you got the right keys for those locked doors. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have to flee. Tell me who can stand me for us when we call on that great name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. We have, we have, we have the victory. Say that you can huff if you want. You can puff if you want. But we have, we have the victory. And as you go into your ministry fields, as you go into your different uh, cities and states, lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Stand on this foundation. Be that Taurus and spirit walk with spiritual warfare. Have the right keys for our doors. And you can have, and you can have, and you can have the victory. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's build the church. Let's build the church. Let's build the church. But God would be glorified. The saints of God would be edified. And lost sinners would come to repentance. That's my choice to you. 
as you leave this place. God bless you. Thank you for inviting me. And may God forever keep you. Do you have keys with you? If you do, why don't you take them out and put them in your hand? Find the keys. Find the keys. Got them? Somebody hold them up? Got them? Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, may these keys, physical, real, tangible in our hands, may they be a reminder every time we feel them, every time we hear them, every time we use them. But although they look real, they're not nearly as real as the spiritual keys Jesus gives to us. May the presence of these keys that we will use throughout our day ever be the reminder to call upon those spiritual keys to unlock the doors Satan tried to shut. Thank you so much, Father for all that you have done for us. As we hear now this closing word from the seminarians, as we think about moving out into what lies ahead, give us the courage, Father, to follow your call with faith in the keys you will provide. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Please be seated for just a moment. Not knowing where we were going, charting the waters of faith, led by his light through the darkness, drawn by the warmth of his grace. Putting our fears behind us, moving through restless sea, trusting him as our captain, not knowing where he would be.